Oh, thank you, Dion. Um, when Dion invited me along to talk here today, he suggested that I talk in a somewhat general sense about my work on, on flows of knowledge. So you'll notice that I go through it. I spend some time talking about people and some time talking about books. But I think all these bits of research are related and what I'm really thinking about underlying is the flows of knowledge. Um, and I hope you won't be too disappointed by the fact I'm not going to show any network diagrams. So let me start with a very simple premise, knowledge matters. So if we think at the economy level, the aggregate knowledge held by society is going to determine the possibilities for that society. So you can think about technological progress and economic growth, and then on the more social side, intellectual, cultural, political development. All these are going to be determined by the, by the knowledge that's been accumulated by that society. At the individual level, we have human capital, so education, skills, knowledge held by an individual. It is really important for determining you know, the person's, what the person's options in life are, what can they do for a career, how much they're going to earn, how, much they, how well are they going to do. And we can also think about a slightly different type of knowledge that's important for in individuals to hold, something that we might refer, or sorry, refer to as information. Um, so if you know, for example, oh, there's a really great job opening that's going to suit your skills, that can be you know, knowledge that's important for you that can help you to do better. Let me just give you a little bit of a brief roadmap of where I'm going to go today. Um, so I'm going to start out just talking a little bit generically about knowledge flows and their empirical study in economics. And I won't claim to speak for all economists, but this is from, from my point of view. Um, and then I'm going to go through and talk about three particular studies that I've done that in some way are looking at knowledge flows. Um, so the first one is using book translations to measure international knowledge flows. And then I'm going to move, move to talking about people and looking at effective employees' experience on firm exporting. And I'm going to finish up by looking at the effects of social networks on labor market outcomes. So it's really, in the long term, it's the accumulation of knowledge that drives economic growth. Um, so as Mokia put it, the central phenomenon of the modern age is that as an aggregate, we know more. So if we compare society where we are today to, say, 100 years ago, we're so much richer, we have so much more options, our standard of living is, is generically so much better because of the accumulated knowledge. We can talk to other people instantaneously on the other side of the world. We have cars that can whip us around over you know, hundreds, of, hundreds of kilometers and hours. We can fly to the other side of the world. Computers, you know, bio, biomedical technology. We have all these things that have greatly improved our, our quality of life. And this is all because this has been accumulated by society. Um, and one important, important thing that's going on here um, knowledge, this knowledge has been able to accumulate in this sense because countries share ideas. So if we imagine that each country could only use the ideas that have been generated within its, its borders, we could imagine we would, have, we would know so much less. And these countries you know, may be growing a lot slower, they may not be growing at all. Um, so Keller, in Keller's calculation, foreign sources of technology account for over 90% of productivity growth in most countries. And if you look, at, look around at various other sources, this is probably pretty conservative. For most countries, it's probably more like you know, 98, 99% of, of te um, technology that's driving economic growth is coming from overseas. So it's pretty important, this fact that countries are able to e import knowledge from each other. Um, so one of the reasons that this works is the property of knowledge. So knowledge is what we would re refer to as non-rivalrous. Um, and I've defined this here. So the use of an idea by one party in no way limits its simultaneous use by, by others. So I'm not saying that, that there might not be um, costs to, so if, some, if one firm has an idea on how to produce some good, and then another firm is using that, then they may be competing in the product market. So I'm not saying that these sorts of effects can't go on, but they can actually both simultaneously use this idea to produce this output. Um, and it's this non-rivalrous nature of, um, of knowledge that drives technological spillovers, and technological spillovers which are which are driving this growth, growth in the long run. So by technological spillovers, I mean that a firm can acquire and use knowledge that's created by other firms without paying for it in a market transaction. So maybe one firm acquires it in a market transaction, but then this benefit spills over to other firms, and they benefit without paying for it. Um, so one important distinction to make here is embodied versus disembodied knowledge. So knowledge in itself is disembodied. So we can't, we can't see knowledge floating around. It's, it's not embodied in anything. And yet it may be embodied at certain times in things. So for example, in goods as equipment, or maybe embodied in people as human capital. Now embodied knowledge, in contrast to disembodied knowledge, is rivalrous. Um, and so it may not generate a technological spillover in the same way. So if we think about, for example, knowledge embodied in a person, so that person can only be working on one thing at a time, or only one thing at a time very well. So if they're then taken away to work on another project, they have to spend less time on the first. So in that sense, the knowledge embodied in the person is rival. 
I just want to mention the distinct, distinction between codified and tacit knowledge at this point. So this is somewhat different to embodied versus disembodied. So when I'm talking about codified versus tacit knowledge, I'm really talking about knowledge that's been written down versus that hasn't. So what type of ideas do we think might matter for growth? I think there are really sort of two, two main types of ideas that we can think about. There are the technological ideas. So I've got a few examples here, but you can think of many more. So for instance, the light bulb and the microchip. So how do we make stuff, essentially? And then there are the non-technological ideas, which we can think of are possibly a little bit more fuzzy, but they might include all sorts of things, like the institutions that help us to organize our society, production processes that help firms to, to, to make things, um, policies, laws, social and political ideas. Um, so these are also potentially more subtly important, but I think are really important in determining the possibilities for a society. Um, so Roma 2010 makes a, a related but not entirely the same distinction. So he's distinguishing technological ideas. So these are, in his words, these instructions on how to rearrange inanimate objects. Um, so example might be, here's how you make a car. And he distinguishes these from rules, these being specifications of how people interact with each other in society. So for example, our rules on how we elect politicians, how these people get into power and then start making rules for us, that would be an example of a rule. And he makes the, he makes the specific point that these rules are examples of ideas and they can also be adopted between countries and their um, incentives that influence whether they're adopted or not also matter in this case. Okay. So when we start to think about the transmission of knowledge, knowledge doesn't just float from whoever creates it to whoever uses it. It has to be transmitted in some sense. And the way I think about it, there's sort of a number of ways that this could happen. So assuming that the creator is not the user of the knowledge, it can be carried either by people. So people learn something and they may you know, go to somebody else and they may transmit what they know. Or else it can be embodied in some sort of external storage device. device. So you might think of this could be a book or it could be a computer or it could be some file or various other types of recording devices. And then thinking about knowledge transmission in this way actually gives us ways to start thinking about, well, how are we going to measure knowledge flows or proxies for knowledge flows? And there are sort of a number of ways that we might do this. So we can try and directly measure this transmission. So for instance, we might talk about phone call records, or if we know someone's sending an email, we can think, okay, I can see that knowledge flow going across. We can also look at movement of these storage devices. So with the example of people, where if we're looking at skilled migration, this is people who have certain knowledge and certain skills who are going from one place to another place, and presumably they're taking their knowledge and skills with them. Um, in a slightly less direct sense, we can look for the effects of knowledge flows. So if we think that knowledge is going from somewhere to somewhere else, we can look for, okay, what are, what are, the, what are the effects that is having? Is there, we might see something like growth that could be at a country level or a firm level or something else, or we might see, for instance, a particular technology has been adopted. Um, so I think each, each of these methods have different advantages and disadvantages, and they can often be quite complementary. So some of the studies they're going to be talking about are going to fall into these various categories. So the first study that I'm going to talk about is I'm using book translations as a measure of disembodied knowledge flows. So this is really in the sort of direct measurement of disembodied um, knowledge flows. So what's the motivation here? Um, the flows of ideas or knowledge between countries are really important but challenging to measure, as I've talked about, and particularly flows of disembodied ideas that are more likely to yield spillovers. So these are the sorts that aren't, aren't skilled migrants, they're not people will, or other things traveling from somewhere to somewhere else, it's just the pure knowledge flows that we're looking at. So what I do in this work is I propose book translations as a measure of idea flows between countries. So I say this is really a flow of disembodied knowledge because we're talking about the number of titles that are being translated. I'm not talking about shipping physical copies of books, which we might think of as an embodied flow. And then I'm going to explore whether physical or cultural distances between the countries affect these translation flows. So it's not immediately obvious that, that distances should, or how distances should affect translations. So if we're thinking about, for a translation to occur, really only one copy of that book has to get from point A to point B. So it's not something with you know, transportation costs that we should be worrying about. And it may be that countries that are, that are further apart from each other actually have more to learn from each other and would benefit more from translating from each other. So it's really an empirical question what the relationship um, between translations and distances. Um, so translations as a measure of knowledge or idea flows have a number of advantages and disadvantages. I think the really nice thing about them is that the key purpose of these is to make an idea that's available in one language that's been codified um, available to speakers of another language. Um, for, in terms of empirical research, it's really nice that they're both quantifiable and classifiable by type. 
So quantifiable, we can count the number of books that are being translated, we can count the number of pages or whatever, whatever your preferred metric is, and then we can analyze these, these numbers. Um, books have standard classifications by type, um, so we can see like, what, are the, what are the areas that these, that they, what sort of knowledge is being transmitted. And if we care, we can actually go and read the books, we can learn everything that we want to about what these ideas are that are going from one linguistic group to another. And they also capture quite a nice broad range of both technical and more social ideas. Um, so we're not limited to just you know, narrow technological ideas, also a lot, lot more sort of cultural, social, potentially fuzzy ideas. Um, of course, they do have some limitations. Um, so an obvious, obvious limitation of book translations, we can only measure idea flows between people who speak different languages. So we can't look at idea flows between the US and the UK for obvious reasons. Um, we can only capture codifiable ideas. So these has to, have to have been written down at some point. Um, so we're excluding you know, tacit knowledge that may be kept best carried transmission face to face. Um, because it takes a certain amount of time to, to write books and to translate books, we're not going to capture you know, very new ideas as they're happening. And also some people are multilingual, so I sort of think that this is a leakage, so this is an additional flow that could be happening between the same groups that we're obviously not going to be able to pick up. Um, right. So the data they use is based on the Index Translationum, which is an international bibliography of translations collected by UNESCO um, from national libraries and depositories. So this, is, this was a, intended as a bibliography for people who wanted to know what books have been translated into what languages. Um, so it has the normal bibliographic type information. So we see the author and the title, what languages it was translated between, what year it was translated, the country, and, and various other information. Um, one limitation is we don't see when, so this is a bibliography of the translations, not the original books, so we don't see when the original book was written. So I went away and collected this for a, a sample of, of titles to help me do a few additional things. Um, so the data they got was annual for 1982 to, to 2000, and this is approximately 2 million translations in 59 countries. Um, and then went back and collected by hand some earlier data, so every fifth year, um, 1949 to 1979, I collected a a representative sample that let me infer what the overall flows in those years were. Um, all right, so what do I do with these data? So my basic estimation model, so what I was trying to estimate is how is the number of titles translated between two countries? How does that depend on the economic sizes of the countries and the distance between them in the most basic sense? So the top model here, this, I've, this is actually the same model twice. The first time I've written it in the multiplicative form, and this is how I actually estimate it. So translation flows as a function of distance and the GDPs of the two countries, an error term at the end there. And then the next one, I've just linearized it into the form that you may be more familiar with, it would be the standard way to estimate it. Um, but I actually estimate in the multiplicative form using a certain maximum likelihood procedure. Um, so basically, the main thing that I'm interested in in this, in this very basic model is the rate at which translation flows change with distance. So what do I find? I find that, in fact, translation flows fall with distance. So two countries that are 10% further apart have 2.9% fewer translations between them. Probably unsurprisingly, I find that countries that are more populous and, and richer also translate more and are translated more. Um, two countries, even that are the same distance apart, if they share a land border, then they have a larger translation flow between them. And also, it looks like migrant populations matter. So if there are more um, migrants from a particular source country in one country, that country's going to translate more out of the native language of those migrants. Um, so these results, that this is for 1991 to 2000, though the overall patterns hold up over a longer period. Yeah. So I do see the country in which the translation occurs. Unfortunately, you can't see the country in which the original book was written. So there are a few complicated things that I do to try and, to try and figure that out and apply, apply some general type rules. But yeah, you do see the country for the, where the translation was. Um, so one potential hypothesis is, well, maybe countries that are further apart translate less from each other because of cultural differences. So cultural differences could have effects for several reasons. So they could affect the cost of translating. So it might be that countries that are very really different culturally, they have trouble conducting business with each other. You know, the expectations are different, things tend to go wrong. This could increase the costs of forming these types of contracts. Um, along similar lines, maybe they just don't trust each other very much. So translation contracts are actually quite complicated. So basically the payment that is required to be given is going to be dependent on some future, like, 
um, realization how many books are sold, and that's going to be pretty difficult for you to monitor if these monitor if these be, are being you know, produced and sold in some foreign country. So a certain amount of trust is required um, for these contracts to be formed. Um, on the other side, it could be that the demand for translations um, is lower between countries that are culturally very different. So maybe they're just interested in different types of different types of subjects, different types of books. <laughs> it could be the expectations about the style of the book is different. Like a maths book that's like brightly coloured and fun might be, you know, really, really horrible and offensive idea in some countries, but some countries might think it's really great. I like colourful, fun maths books. Okay. So what do we find? Well, cultural differences turn out not to not to be driving this relationship between translations and distance, physical distance, but they do matter. So two countries with entirely different religions translate 80% less from each other than two countries that have entirely the same religion. Um, translations between languages that are unrelated in the language tree translate 72 to 79% less than each other, from each other than closely related languages. I actually didn't find a robust relationship between genetic distance and translations, um, but I did find that sort of a, a a survey measure, so Hofstede's measure of cultural distance, so one standard deviation increase in that sort of distance was related in 8% um, fewer translations. So it does look like there is something going on with cultural um, distances. Yeah. Can you clarify fiction versus non-fiction? Yeah, so we actually did a, a whole pile of analysis that did break it down by field. I don't present that today because I'm trying to do the short version, but there were some pretty significant differences between field. Um, and actually not entirely the direction you'd, you'd expect. So the sort of the more hard science, science-y type um, books actually decreased more with cultural different distances than, than the, yeah. So I found that quite surprising. Okay. So one, another thing you might ask is, well, is this the same in every country? So it could be that some countries are better at finding this foreign information and, and importing it. Um, so then I did it. So I let the, the effective distance differ for countries depending on their level of development. And what I find is that it actually matters quite a lot. So translations that are going into a country with per capita income of 5,000 a year fall nearly twice as fast as those going into a country with per capita income of 20,000 a year. Um, I also find that translations into poorer countries fall more with linguistic distance. So what I think this is, is suggesting is that there are some sort of, there are sort of barriers to accessing international knowledge um, that developing countries may have more difficulty overcoming these barriers. And I think from a, from a macro point of view, this is pretty important because it's these countries that are furthest behind the international knowledge frontier. And are these, it's these countries that have most that they can learn from overseas countries. And the fact that they seem to be having more difficulty accessing this could have some, some pretty important implications. Um, just a couple of additional results. Um, so I found that in terms of changes over time, distance does seem to be becoming less important. So if you can compare 1949 relative to 1999, the relationship between translations and distance is sort of twice as twice as strong in 1949. Um, another result that I, that I found is that books also seem to be translated somewhat slower in countries that are further apart, so with a longer lag after when the book is originally published. So it seems like countries that are further apart are not only getting less information from each other, but the information is also getting there somewhat slower. All right, so let me just sum up. So we've been studying here a measure of disembodied knowledge flows, and the findings are really suggesting that, you know, there are, there are barriers to international diffusion of knowledge, which we should be thinking about. It is not automatic. It's not costless. It seems like physical and cultural um, distances are inhibiting knowledge flows, and this is particularly the case for developing countries. Right. So I've been talking about books as transmission mechanisms, and now I'm going to start uh, make a bit of a change and start talking about people as transmission mechanisms. So I think that people can transfer different types of knowledge to what we might think about being transferred by books. So there's some sorts of knowledge that are just best conveyed face to face. There, it's hard to write down all the possibilities, and and and, and they're just better if you can have back and forwards conversations. I might think that in many cases, these sorts of information or knowledge are actually, could actually be quite complementary to the codifiable written types of knowledge that we've just been talking about. So a pretty important question is, well, if people are, if people are moving from somewhere to somewhere else, how do we know what knowledge they're taking with them that's being transmitted? And, and so often we'll look at the effects of movements of people. Um, so that's what I'm going to be doing in this, in this study. I'm going to be looking at the effects of employees um, where they came from, their past experience on the exporting of their current employer. Um, 
So just thinking about people as carriers of knowledge, we might think they could potentially carry knowledge in a number of, of different senses. So and they can carry knowledge between countries internationally if they migrate between regions of a country. Or if they're moving between employers or, or other organizations of various types, they could carry knowledge between these. And of course, you've been hearing a lot about today, um, individuals can carry knowledge without actually physically going anywhere, just by interacting with different individuals in their day-to-day in -day network. Um, so the research question that I'm going to look at here is, do certain types of employees bring knowledge to their firms that helps their firm, help their firms to export? And I'm going to be looking particularly at two types of employees. So first of all, I'm going to look at foreign employees or employees of specific nationalities. So we think that these individuals, maybe they understand the cultural or business practices or the preferences of their home country in some way that's going to help them, um, to help their employer to set up exporting relationships to these countries. Or maybe that they have personal contacts back in their home country and that can help them to, to hook up with somebody to, <coughs> to start the exporting. Um, the second type of employees that I'll look at is those with experience working for an exporter. Um, so you would think that if somebody has worked for an exporter previously, they may have picked up not inside knowledge that, that will help them to know how to do this more successfully and they could carry this to their current employer. Um, so both of these mechanisms are really suggesting um, people are carrying knowledge from somewhere they've gained it previously to their current employer and that they, we're looking for the effect of this. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the data because I think this is a really, it's a really rich and also underutilized resource that we have here. Um, unfortunately, it's currently only available um, through the secure environment in the Statistics New Zealand Data Lab, but the rules along this, these lines have been relaxing over recent years, so we do hope that in the future it may become more widely available. Um, so the first part of this is the linked employer-employee data. So these are based on administrative tax data, and it covers all firms in New Zealand and all employees. Um, and these data are linked into other, various other administrative and survey data in what Statistics New Zealand calls the integrated data infrastructure. So what we can see in, the, in these data for the purposes of this research, so we can see employees moving between firms, we can see where they're employed currently, what they're earning, and we can link in various other individual information. Um, and these employee-employee data are linked into the um, Business Operations Survey, or BOSS, which is conducted for a sample of firms every year. And this is where we get our exporting data from. Um, so the next thing that I'm interested in is foreign employees. So how do I know if employees are foreign? So these employer-employee um, data sets, they're also linked into um, data from passport swipes on border crossings. So every time somebody comes into or out of New Zealand, they have to show their passport and various things are recorded. And these data are linked back to the um, employee data. So we can actually see an employee working at a firm, and we can see when they go overseas, and we can see when they come back. Um, and then we have various um, bits of information about this, including the nationality of the passport that they're using. So what I do is I define foreigners by the nationality of the passport that they use and their first border crossing in the six years before the boss year. So it may be that they use different passports later on. I'm going to disregard these, and particularly with the idea that some foreigners will, will naturalise and so they'll start using a New Zealand passport later on, but we may still want to think of them as foreigners. Um, if somebody has no border crossings over this period, I'm going to consider them a native, which is probably not entirely true, but if they're not a native, they have been in the country the whole time for the last six years. Um, and then I aggregate these data up to the firm level. Basically, it's the fraction of employees who are foreign. And over the firms in the sample, this has an average of 16.5%. Okay. Um, so the other thing about employees that we want to know is we want to know about their past experience working for exporters. Um, so I'm looking at employers who these people have worked for in the current year or in the past five years, and if they've worked for the same employer for at least six months. Um, so unfortunately, because BOSS is only a survey, so we don't have full coverage, I had to do a few, a few things with the data here. So I'm basically going to categorize past employers into three groups. So there are firms who are in the BOSS survey who we know export, there are firms in the BOSS survey who we know don't export, and then there are firms that are not sampled in BOSS, and so we don't know what the export status is. Unfortunately, not being in BOSS is not random because the sample probability increases with firm size and larger firms are more likely to export, so we need to account for this in some way. Um, so the way I do it is I aggregate up so the fraction of employees who, are pre who fall into certain groups. So those who we know work for an exporter, and this is an average of 7.6% across firms. Those who we know didn't work for an exporter, but we know did work for a non-exporter, and that's 16.8% of employees. And then those who we know work for some other firm, but not any firm that we know anything about. 
Right, so that's 36.3%. And I wanted to include these last movers because we might think if a firm has a lot of new employees, that could be good because they're growing or it could be bad because they really pissed off their last employees and they all quit, so they need to rehire the new people. So we want to, we want to control for that. All right. So what did we find? So this is the results um, from two regressions looking at the relationship between foreign employees and, firm and exporting. So the first column here is um, just results from a pretty simple regression. So we're also controlling here for the size of the firm, um, for the survey year, the industry the firm operates in, and the region of the country it's operating in. Um, so what we see here is that a firm with, say, 10 percentage points more foreign employees is 0.69 percentage points, or 4% relative to the mean, more likely to export. So this is positive and significant, though it's a reasonably small relationship. Um, but what about worker ability? So it might be that um, foreigners have a different average ability to natives, or it might be that only actually high ability foreigners matter for firm exporting. Um, so in the second column, we break this down looking at the fraction of the employees of the firm who have high ability overall and those who are high ability foreigners. And we actually find the relationship between foreign employees and exporting is driven entirely by high ability foreigners. Um, so if we think about replacing low ability foreigners in the firm with, sorry, low ability natives in the firm with low ability foreigners, that's not going to be really related with the exporting behavior of the firm. But if we replace, say, 10% of employees, if we change those from being high ability natives to high ability foreigners, that's associated with a 3.5 percentage point increase in the probability of exporting. And that's 21% relative to the means. That's a pretty large number. Um, so I have to say at this point, we can't say that these relationships are necessarily causal because we haven't dealt with the endogeneity problem. So it may just be that high-ability foreigners are just attracted to the, to the types of firms that export or are just able to find jobs at those sorts of firms. Um, and so I can't deal with that all that satisfactorily here, um, but there is a little bit that I, that I can go, go on and do. Um, so what we look at next is we look at are these firms with foreign employers more likely to export in general, or are they more likely to export to the origin country of the foreign employees? So if it's just that foreign employees are attracted to the types of firms that export, then we wouldn't expect those firms to specifically be exporting to the country of the foreign employees. Whereas if it's that these foreign employees have particular information or particular contacts, then it's more likely that, that we will see that country-specific link. Um, so here are the results from um, two, two more regressions. So if you take a look at column one first, so the dependent variable, variable here is whether the firm earns income roughly exports to, this, to a specific country. And I'm only looking at the major trading partners of New Zealand. And then we're looking at how does that relate to the fraction of employees who are from that specific country or who are foreign in general. Um, so the way to interpret these results, essentially what it's saying, um, it looks like a firm is more likely to export to any specific country if it has more foreign employees, but that relationship is more than three times as strong if the foreign employees are from that specific country. Um, so one question we might ask, does it matter if this trading partner is a developed or a developing country? And actually it does matter a lot. Um, so essentially if we think about a specific developed country, um, it's, really, it's really good for the firm to have a lot of foreign employees from that um, specific country, but that's not the case if we're looking at a, de a developing country. Um, so that relationship overall is, is entirely driven by um, exporting to developed countries. So why do we think there might be this difference between develop and de developed and developing countries? So I guess there could really be a number of things going on. So one obvious point, it could be the skill level of the migrants. So I haven't really been able to, I haven't um, controlled ability here because we start to get down to quite small numbers and we don't have any power. But it could be that the skill level of the migrants, just on average, is, is pretty different, the skills that they're bringing. It could also be the types of goods and services that we're exporting to these different sorts of countries. So we do tend to export more raw goods to developing countries and more like highly manufactured goods. Um, to more developed countries, and there could be some differences going on there. It could be that there are, in some sense, different barriers to trade with these different countries, and having natives from that country is only useful in overcoming certain of those barriers. Um, um, I'm not going to say too much about the results in terms of employee experience, um, but basically the results are consistent with the fact that for, um, employees who previously worked for an exporter may have picked up knowledge that are then going to take their current employee and help those to export. Um, but again, we can't, we can't deal particularly satisfactorily with the, with the problem of endogeneity. Um, so in this, in this piece of research, we've looked at whether employees can take knowledge of their firms that help them to export. And I think the results are pretty consistent with, 
foreign employees and employees with prior experience working with an exporter bring useful knowledge um, for exporting. And this is particularly the case for high ability employees and for foreign employees from developed countries. Although I haven't been able to, to deal with the causal, um, issue of causality all that definitively. And I'm required to show you this and I don't expect you to read it. All right, so people can also act as conduits for knowledge when they're not actually going anywhere. Um, so it could be just through their daily interactions with people. So it could be the sorts of knowledge that's, that's really useful for economic growth that we're talking about, and people could be learning things and sharing them within their networks, or it could be more information that's pertinent to the individual, so information about you know, job opportunities or, or this type of thing. So here I'm going to be looking more at people who aren't going anywhere as conduits for information. So the research questions I'm going to talk at here, I'm going to ask what types of people choose to live in areas where they have a strong social network? And then how does living in such an area affect an individual's labour market outcome? Um, so I'm going to use Maori iwi, or tribes, as a measure of social groups, so that these are predetermined social groups, and then rohi, or traditional areas, as the areas in which these individuals have a, have a strong network. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I do that in a minute. So why do we think that living somewhere where you have a strong network could, could have an effect? Well, for a start, I think there may be potential knowledge benefits. So it could be that this network of, of people you know and interact with a lot is providing information, say, on, on employment opportunities. And it may also help you secure employment once you've found a job that you want. So, for instance, by conveying credible information about your quality to the potential employer. Um, so as well as knowledge benefits, I think there could be other benefits and potentially costs to living in such an area. So it could be that having this network is going to reduce the cost of working. So, for instance, by providing childcare. So if you go off to work and give your kids, kids to your parents and they can look after them for the day. Um, there could be other non-market benefits like social and cultural activities. Um, on the other side, there could actually be costs because you, if you're one of the better off people on the network, you may be expected to look, look after some of the less fortunate people. And it could actually be that um, living in such an area changes your preferences for leisure if leisure is more valuable when you have you know, other people you like and want to hang out with to spend, spend time with. Um. All right, so the data I use in this, um, in this project are unit record census data from 1996-2001-2006. So these are individual level data. Um, so in the census, individuals are allowed to give up to three self-defined ethnicities. Um, so we're going to distinguish two types of ethnicities. So sole Māori, or those who report Māori as their only ethnicity, and also mixed Māori, or those who report at least one ethnicity. So a sample is essentially going to be New Zealand-born Māori, aged 30 to 59 currently, and we're going to look at males and females separately. Um, so Māori are also asked to state up to five iwi, or tribal affiliations. Um, so we're going to exclude those who state no affiliations who are who are a minority, and we're also going to focus on the first named affiliation, and most individuals don't do at least state one affiliation. Um, we have external geocoded information on the area that each iwi considers to be its home area, and we link this up to the geographical information in the, in the census on current location and location five years ago. Um, so let me just say, for it, so I'm going to use whether one lives and one's rohi as a measure of whether one lives in a strong network area. Um, so you might ask, why am I doing that, given that we actually know where the E we live and we, we can calculate what are these strong network areas. So we actually do that in the paper, um, but the coefficients are more complicated to interpret because yeah, you have to account for exactly what that means. So I'm just going to present the Rohi results here, but they're actually very strongly correlated. So the individual strong network areas are you know, very, very similar to, to where they're raw here. Um, all right, so what do we find in terms of location choice? So basically we find that Māori are more likely to live in their rohi, or similarly in areas where they're having a strong network. If they are less educated, and this is particularly the case for men, if they're older, at least among, among working age adults, and they state Māori as their sole ethnicity, and also if they have children. Um, so I think this education one is, is probably the most interesting for my purposes. So, you know, what, what do we think might be going on here? I guess one thing, it could be that the less educated people are less mobile. If you tend to be born into your, born in your rohi and you're less mobile, you're less likely to move away. Moving away to, to labour market opportunities may be less of a thing for you. Um, it could be that the low education types face fewer of the, face fewer of the costs and reap more of the benefits of this network as a sort of social support system. 
or it could be that uh, there are sort of different, different values that people hold if they're low education or high education. So high, high education may be the people who value labor mar market success and therefore pursue education and are more likely to move to, move to job opportunities. And with, whereas low education types may value you know, family and being close to their um, family, and family and friends more highly. All right, so how do the labor market outcomes differ for individuals who are living in their Rohi relative to other areas? Um, so I'm showing, for males and females, I'm showing the results from three different regressions here um, with the dependent variables across the top. So each of these regressions are also controlling for a number of individual characteristics. I particularly want you to note that we, we include labor market area fixed effects. So we're comparing people who are living in the same area of the country. Um, just for some individuals, it's the Rohi, and for some, it is not. Um, so if we look, look at these just in general, what we see is that men, in the, men who live in Nairobi tend to have slightly weaker labor market outcomes, whereas women's labor market outcomes seem to be pretty similar. So on the top left-hand corner, we see a man living in his Rohi is 2.4 percentage points less likely to be employed than a man who's living in the same area, but for whom is not their, their Rohi. Um, and if you look at, that, look at these results for women, it doesn't look like there's a great deal going on there. So the only significant coefficient we're talking about less than $300 a year, which I don't think is a, is a particularly economically significant amount. So why do we think these, um, why are these outcomes different for people who are living in their rohi? Well, I think there are, there are probably two things that are contributing to these, these coefficients <laughs> should, that will affect how we, should, how we should be interpreting these. So the first is that there's a, there's a selection effect. So we are controlling for observable characteristics of these individuals, but individuals who choose to live in their rohi are also likely to differ in ways that we just can't measure. So they may, be, they may have different motivation, different ability, you know, different values, interests. And so we can't, we can't pick this up in um, what we're doing at the moment. And then there's also the aspect that I think what we're interested in, which is the treatment effect of the network. So this is you know, how much do you benefit or how, what is the cost to you in your labor market outcomes because of the fact that you're living in this area where you have a strong network. Um, so what we're going to do to try and get at this, so we're going to look at people who used to, who used to live in a Rohi area or used to live in a non-Rohi area and who moved out of that area. And we're going to compare them after this move when they're away from this treatment effect. Um, so we do need, so in order for that comparison to tell us something about the people who are living in their Rohi or not originally, um, we do need to assume that sort of the selection on unobservables and leaving a Rohi area is similar to the selection on unobservables and leaving a non-Rohi area. Um, and if that's the case, then we can compare these people who have left these areas, and that will tell us something about the people who are still there. Um, all right, so we do that next. Um, so if you look at the very top row here, these are the regressions that I showed you before. So looking just for men, um, so these are the, this is the whole population that we're looking at, and the coefficient of interest is on whether they currently live in their Rohi. And this, I've just copied these coefficients from previously. Now if we move down to regression two, so this is this movers regression that I just mentioned. So here we're only looking at people who have moved in the last five years and who currently live outside their rohi. Um, so in these regressions, I'm including um, labor market area or region fixed effects and also labor market area five years ago fixed effects. So these are people who moved from the same area to the same area, but for some of them, the area they came from was their rohi and for some it was not. So we're not actually leaving ourselves with a lot of variation to pick up to pick up stuff here. So what you can see in the case of men is men who came from the Rohi actually look quite a bit worse than men who came from other areas. So particularly in hourly income among the, those who are employed was 6.2% lower, um, or 17, 1,700 a year lower in terms of total income. Um, so let's see, so this first, these first ones that I talked about, this is what I was talking about originally, this is selection plus treatment. And then if we're looking at these people who we've taken out of their network, then we think of just the selection effect. And so what do we do? Then we take the difference, and we think of this as our estimate of the treatment effect of living in your Rohi area. Um, and if we look at the, the same columns down the um, rows down the bottom for women, it looks like there are a few significant things going on there. So in terms of employment, it looks like living in a Rohi is likely to make a woman, um, so 2.5 percentage points more likely to be employed and have a $900 higher total income. Um, so it does look like there are actually some, some effects of living in this network area. And as I mentioned, we have a lot of fixed effects in here, so I was quite surprised that sort of anything is left after we, after we controlled for all these. Um, 
So that these inferences are based on the same selection of movers assumption. We, we can't exactly test because we can't see selection on, on um, unobservables. But what we can do is look at selection on observables. Um, so this is what we do. So we basically estimate an equation and look at predicted income based on observable characteristics for all, for, uh, all individuals. And then look, look at how does selection on this predicted income into moving out of a Rohe area differ for those moving out of a non rohi area. So to cut a long story short, what we find is that the assumption actually looks pretty good for women, but for men, those moving out of a rohi are slightly more positively selected than those moving out of another area. So what this means is that we think that these treatment effects of living in a strong network area for men are actually slight underestimates of what the true value is. So we said that men earn 4 point something percent more because they live in a strong network area, so it's probably actually a bit more than that. Um, All right. So what we've seen overall here, so Māori who live in the Rohi or a strong network area tend to be those who would have had weaker labour market outcomes no matter where they were living. But it does look like living in the Rohi actually has, a, actually has some treatment effect. So it seems to be helping men into higher paying jobs and helping women into employment and therefore higher total income. And this is consistent with these strong local networks acting as a source of information and also on, say, on job opportunities and potentially also providing some non-knowledge benefits, maybe things like childcare for women. Another disclaimer that I'm required to show you. This one's shorter. I still don't expect you to read it. All right, so I've shown you lots of stuff. What, what am I thinking about now? So I think that integrated data infrastructure that Statistics New Zealand has offers some really exciting opportunities for studying the diffusion of knowledge across a network of firms and employees in New Zealand. And so Dion and I have started talking about some things that we might want to look into this in a more, more of a network sense than I've looked at previously. I also think in terms of studying knowledge, we need to think really big. There's so much going on these days that is collecting data. Firms have all sorts of data for all sorts of reasons. And I think lots of these things can, if we think big, there are, there are lots of opportunities for going out and finding new data sets that will let us get it, looking at knowledge flows in new and exciting ways. Thank you. Um, so, the, yeah, the coefficient there is negative, but the magnitude is pretty small relative to the standard error, so I wouldn't make too much of that. Um, it's possible that it may actually be a true effect, so you might think that men who live in an area where they have lots of friends prefer to go to the pub and hang out and would rather not be employed, but, you know, the coefficient is, is pretty small and I'd say it's insignificant, so I wouldn't make too much of that. Yeah. And the idea was that then you know, the children underinvested in education and human capital that they had. A, a and potentially the lang la local language as well. Yeah, right. exactly. And so, yeah. so they did assimilate into the, the larger network as well. And, and so that it, it would be interesting to, to know what the timing on the, I don't know if you can, in your data, whether you can have the effect of how long somebody's been in the, you know, actually look at skills acquisition. And whatever, and yeah. Um, so I guess we're not thinking about a migrant group. They've been here longer than us. <laughs> so, so I guess it's a slight, slightly different way to think about it. Unfortunately, we don't know in the census data where somebody was born. So we know they're born in New Zealand or in some foreign country. So we can't see they moved to this particular region at a certain date, which is unfortunate because that would be really nice if you could see they've been in this region for so long. And we can see they lived. So we know where they are now, where they were five years ago. Um, and they also say um, how long they've been living in their current residence, except I don't trust those data all that much because if you look at a lot of people who moved into the region in the last five years and they've been living in the same house for 20 years, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I don't have a lot of faith in those data. But you're right, it would be really interesting if we could look at sort of assimilation and, and thinking about a, a more time aspect. Arabic ever. 
There are a lot of translations into Spanish. Yeah. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I suspect it may well be, and that I don't think. I think translations into Arabic are relatively low. Translations into Spanish are pretty high. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. For <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I didn't actually try and break it down. Um, so the way I the way I look at religions, I have about sort of thirteen categories, and there are a, a few a number of categories of of Christianity and then various other religions. But I wasn't looking particularly are there certain languages that are more receptive to to others. One of the a, a sort of related thing that I did, I wondered if um, more democratic countries. Are more, are more open to receiving like non-democratic ideas than non-democratic countries are to receiving. So it's not, it's not exactly the same thing, but I did look at directionality a little bit there. And I actually found surprising little. Um, so I don't know if that's, it's, it is somewhat surprising. I mean, I would think that there are probably some religions that are much more open to, to outside ideas than others, but I haven't actually looked at that in the data. So I'm just trying to reconcile that like, really striking stats about translations into Arabic with um, the output from your regression, which says, well, if we think they have, if, so cultur, cult, there, are, there are large cultural barriers to translation. So culturally, very different countries will translate a lot less from each other. Um, if we think Arabics are culturally very different from, a part, part of it is the, the original languages that most, um, most books are translated out of. So there are five plus thousand languages in the world. Many of them are very small, but most of them have like no translations out of them each year. And there are certain languages um, and that books tend to be translated out of, and these I think are largely pretty distant from Arabic, so maybe that's maybe that's part of what's going on, or part of it could be if you think about, I don't know much about the politics of the Arabic world, but if these people tend to be learning, for example, English, then there may be less need to translate um, books into Arabic. Yeah, I mean, it could be it could be that this is a fairly closed culture that they don't appreciate, you know, ideas from other cu other cultures. It could be something that's going on like that. I'm not really sure. So I guess I guess I only go to 2000. So that's sort of when the internet is starting to become important. Um, I do think it'll be really interesting if we could track that through the forwards and see what's going on. I suspect maybe some of what you'd see is that we'd just be missing more of what's going on. So maybe our data will become less um, less um, informative as other as other things become as you sort of have the, all the internet um, things that would open up these other avenues for knowledge diffusion. But no, I'm not sure. No, definitely, I think the, the the interaction between these types of knowledge flows and, and knowledge that's flowing on the internet. And people always bring up the example of like Google Translate, and if you look at if you look at two languages that you know there are a lot of people going two ways, then I think Google Translate actually tends to give you a pretty good idea of what these things mean um, when you click Translate. But if you're looking at two languages where there's not so many people who speak both, and there's, these flows aren't so much, that you're still getting you know pretty much total garbage when you try and translate these things. So I think you know we're we are heading in that direction where these, these things may have more importance, but I think we're still still heading along the way. Yeah, so quite possibly. Yeah. Yeah. That could be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite interesting when you look at different Wikipedia Wikipedia articles, like which articles you can get in which languages, and a lot of it is a local information sort of thing. It's like this is only going to be interesting to, and you can see some really obscure thing that's only about some specific, you know, specific aspect of one country, and it's in the language of that country, and it's in English largely. Um, whereas some things that are like, you know, generally interesting, it's in every language you can think of. It's coffee time. It's coffee time. <laughs> <laughs>